Lord, as we now come together a little bit, bit of time around your word, I pray, dear Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your word. May the soil of our lives be receptive, Lord, to what we hear. And may it influence us. And may it change us. Change us into your likeness. So that we can better represent you to the world around us. In your name we pray, dear Lord. Amen. Okay, team, we are uh, still in Colossians. You'll be pleased to know this is now the ninth month. So we start the ninth month of teaching in Colossians. Uh, we won't finish it today, so I'll just give you a heads up on that. But I do plan to have it finished next week all going well. So that will be done and dusted. So nine months, I feel after nine months it's worth giving birth and moving on to something else, right? <laughs> so um, anyway, we'll get, this, we'll get this all wrapped up before then. Uh, some of you, hopefully most of you, will have been um, introduced to things as we've journeyed through the book that will have made you ponder, maybe. Maybe make you think a little bit, which is good, which is good. We want thinking people in the church. I don't mean academic, highbrow intellectuals, although it's great to have those people because they can do all of the stuff that us normal mortals can't do, which is engage with people at that higher academic level. But just thinking people, understand what your faith is, know why you believe what you believe, understand how to give a good defence for it when people talk to you, understand what's tradition, understand what's scripture, understand there is a difference between tradition and scripture. And a lot of what happens in tradition has got nothing to do with scripture at all. But anyway, but the church, you know, the church, we need to be that, that body of people who during this age of grace, this kairos time, that we approach folk that we approach folk um, and that we approach folk with a heart that is motivated and a thought process that is motivated so that when we open our mouth to speak, our words are such that they afford joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness within the grace of our speech. That's a challenge, church. It's a challenge. And as we present our thoughts and our speech like that, we do it in a sacrificial way. It's presented as an offering in order to promote growth, to develop relationships, which will then hopefully persevere and stand the test of time. And we saw that when we were looking last week at Tychicus, not Tichy Cuz, Paul's younger cousin, smaller younger cousin but Tychicus and Onesimus two very different men very different backgrounds work together to bring the good news to others around them two very very ordinary people used to bring the message of the grace of God to, to numerous other people by introducing them to the person of Jesus <coughs> both of them took the chance to step out and then to step up in order to bring the message that they were entrusted with. And their, their testimony leaves us with the same sort of challenge in terms of forging relationships. We forge relationships by standing on common ground. And then once we've got that common ground, we can then show folk the, the wonderful characteristics of this God-man that we, that we serve. It's a great privilege that each of us have been given in this age, you know. It's not one to be taken lightly. It's not one to be glossed over. We have this kairos time, this divinely appointed time, this right time, this age of grace, and all of the opportunities that God has placed before us within this time. It's a privilege. And so these guys, Tychicus, Onesimus, they... They can inspire us by what they did, how they stepped up into what they had. So what are the folk to come in the next part of the letter then? How are they going to inspire us? Well, I guess the only way we're going to know is if we have a look, isn't it, really? So we'll have a look at that. I'm going to jump back into Colossians. We're going to look at Colossians 4, verse 10 to 14. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It goes like this. Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you his greetings, and so does Mark, Barnabas' cousin. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. 
Jesus, the one we call Justus, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my co-workers. They're working with me here for the kingdom of God. And what a comfort they've been. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved doctor, sends his greetings and so does Demas. Names. More names. Six folk. I'm not going to talk about Barnabas because he's not actually included. That was just a, a setting up to show who the Mark was, you know. So it's Barnabas' cousin, Mark. Six folk mentioned here. Six folk who have been working alongside Paul, who've joined him uh, for the mission of spreading this gospel of grace across the land. And he divides these six up into two groups. So you've got the first three that are named there, Aristarchus, Mark and Jesus, Justus. These guys are Jewish, all Jewish guys. The remaining three, Paphras, Luke, Demas, these guys are Gentiles. Now, Paul may well have written it like this just as a matter of coincidence. Could it just be coincidence that he's teed it up like that? Or he may have been pointing something else out about the kingdom of God, that both Jew and Gentile come together to do the work of the kingdom of God with equal input, Jew and Gentile. You see, the movement that was being kicked off, the way, was a bit of an in inclusive movement within a very exclusive living space. So the movement was inclusive. It wanted to include everybody. But it was within a very exclusive living space. The Judaic belief was, was very, very exclusive. And with this movement of the way, this sect of Judaism, the Judaic belief system was going to get a little bit uncomfortable. It was going to get a little bit stretched in order to accommodate the rest of the world, the Gentiles, the you's and me's of the world. And any stretch like that within an organisation, uh, within a religious structure, is going to cause challenges, always. And this sect of Judaism was no different to that. So what can we learn then from this ragtag bunch of different folk? It's one of the things I love about this fellowship. It's full of ragtag different folk. Um, we're all different. We've all got different backgrounds. We've all got different views. But we come together. And we come together week after week to focus on who unites us. Not on our differences, but on who unites us. So let's have a look at this. Aristarchus then. Aristarchus, his name means the best ruler. The best ruler. We know that he was um, a Macedonian and he was from Thessalonica. We've heard about him when we read about him last week in Acts 20, uh, 1 to 5. We, we got a little bit of a story about Aristarchus going on there. He was one of the two guys from Thessalonica, uh, the other one being Secundus. Uh, they made up that motley crew that were travelling with Paul from Macedonia and Greece. It also seems that uh, Aristarchus was alongside Paul when that plot was made to kill him by the Jews. He was also one of those who headed up ahead of them uh, to Troas uh, to wait for Paul and Luke to arrive. We also know... That Aristarchus was on, the, on board the uh, Adramitium uh, with Paul and Luke, and that's found for us in 27 verse 2 of Acts. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was Adramitium on the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province. And this was Paul's last journey on his way to Rome, this journey that Aristarchus was with him on. You know, Aristarchus is a bit of a bloke. He's a bit of a keeper. Aristarchus, he really is. He's another ordinary person. How many of you have ever pondered the, the life and the role of Aristarchus in your many, many years of Christian belief? Probably not many of you. Aristarchus, interesting dude, ordinary person, presented to us in Scripture, and we gloss over his name, don't we? We gloss over him. So just take a moment to reflect on him and his adventures, just for a moment, alongside Paul. He was a Macedonian. Who, who at some point had come to saving faith in Christ as Messiah of Israel, and he got alongside Paul. 
He got alongside Paul, and the first we hear of him, he's caught up in a riot. He's caught up in a riot in Ephesus after Paul had crossed swords with that silversmith Demetrius. And, and there was an accusation that was levied against Paul about the goddess Artemis was being robbed of her prestige and all the rest of it um, by this, this newfangled peach, uh, preaching of the way. This newfangled preaching, stealing, robbing the prestige of Artemis. And the results recorded for us, isn't it, in Acts 19, 28 to 29. At this, their, ra- their anger boiled and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon... The whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheatre, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's travelling companions from Macedonia. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine how terrifying that would be? I've been involved in riots. Riots are not pretty places to find yourself. They really aren't. But not only do you find yourself in the riot, you are then dragged off into an amphitheatre. What happens in amphitheatres back in the day? You got fed to the lions. You got fed to the lions. So we've got this poor fella here, travelling with Paul, wrapped up in a, a, a riot, dragged off to a place where hungry animals hang out, waiting to uh, be let loose on both criminal and political prisoners. And we've already noted, haven't we, that he sailed with Paul to Rome. Now... What we need to remember is that ship sank. So that ship that Aristarchus was on sank and everybody on board was shipwrecked and eventually stepped foot on that little island of Malta. And then three months later, he and Paul arrive in Rome where Paul refers to him as a fellow prisoner. So the term for a fellow prisoner in the Greek is literally a prisoner of war. Sunahik Malatos. Prisoner of war, a fellow captive. The man whose name was the best ruler, Aristarchus, is now a fellow captive. Now, whether Aristarchus was under, uh, under arrest by Rome is actually unclear. But it's more likely that he was actually considered a prisoner of Christ. That he was a prisoner of Christ, just like Paul was. Paul may have been under the Roman Empire, but he was actually a prisoner of Christ. The bonds of fellowship would have been like a chains wrapped around somebody in prison for Aristarchus, I think. A prisoner to the will of God in Jesus Christ. So, think about what this guy's gone through. Is he bitter? Is he twisted? Well, he doesn't appear to, does he? he Colossians 4.10 says that he sends his greetings He sends his greetings. He wishes the church all the best. If it had been me, I'd be sending for my get-out-of-jail-free card, you know? Get out. This guy, caught up in a riot, dragged into an amphitheatre, shipwrecked, fellow prisoner, and after all that, he goes, oh, send my best to the church. Send my love. Good on him. Good on him. Aristarchus had a faith that was forged in fire and adversity. And you know what? He stuck with it. He stuck with it. He didn't give up. He kept pressing on, not abandoning hope, not abandoning those who he supported. I remember the church. Bless them. And he did so in that mindset that he was able, as a fellow prisoner, to be able to pass on his greetings and his best to the churches. What a role model. What a great role model. And not only that, but he had a young fellow with him, didn't he? who also passes along his greetings. That's Mark. We see that, Mark. Mark, Marcos. Name means a defence. A defence. Well, Paul certainly got defensive with him, didn't he? We know a little bit about that. This young fellow who had previously got right up Paul's nose is now actually with him in Rome in his final days on planet Earth. If you remember, it, it was Mark who fell out with Paul. And he ditched both him and Barnabas on that first missionary journey. Uh, We we, we know he was working with them in Cyprus. We read of that in Acts 13, 4 to 5. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. And there in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. So we know that this guy was wrapped up with them. This is Acts 13, right? 4 and 5. 
a few short verses later, verse 13, Mark bugs out on them. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. And there John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, not only did he ditch the pair of them, but he then became the, the pivot point on which a disagreement arose between both Paul and Barnabas, causing them to then fall out and to go their separate ways and carry off different ministries in different directions. Take a look at Acts 15. Paul and Barnabas, they've been, they've been staying in Antioch for a decent amount of time. Then they, this conversation comes up where Paul makes a suggestion. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul disagreed strongly. Since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. So we don't know what went on to, in Pamphylia to actually sort of cause this breakdown in relationship, but whatever it was, Paul was so ticked off about it that when Barnabas suggested it, he went, oh, I'm not having a bar of that. I'm not having any of that. Speculation, but when I think of Paul, I, I, can, I can imagine that he would have probably been a bit of a nightmare to be around at times. I think Paul would have been quite hard work. You know, he was, he was so zealous in his faith I don't know how much fun he'd have been to hang out with. I'm not sure he'd have been that fun guy. I, don't, I think he'd have been wonderful to watch. I think he'd have been wonderful to listen to. I think he'd have been wonderful to be with, but probably at arm's distance. Because I'm not sure what sort of crack you could have had with Paul. Because he was so... Vroom, sold out. He was a zealot. We've all seen them. Uh, oh, sorry, is it just me? <laughs> have, have, you, have you not met people in the past who are just so sold out for Christ that you can't even have a crack with them? Must be just me. Must be just me. I don't know. I don't know how light he would have been, but I, I guess we won't know for a while. And Mark was young. Mark was a young guy, right? And maybe the intensity, the expectation of Paul was just too great for him. He just couldn't cope with it. He was wanted to hang out with his skating dudes and do that sort of thing or something like that who knows all that said all that said later on at his time of need in his incarceration mark's there mark's there with paul and we know from paul's second letter to timothy that paul actually requested his presence to timothy 4 11 only luke is with me bring mark with you when you come for he will be helpful for me in my ministry. Whatever the cause of the breakdown in the relationship, ultimately both stroppy old Paul and inexperienced Mark, they got over themselves. They got over themselves and they met on common ground. Common ground being their faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus, Messiah of Israel, and the good news of reconciliation to all who put their faith in him. So even though they disagreed, Paul doesn't hold any of that against him. In fact, what he does is he commends him to the church in Colossae. We read about that in the, later on in the verse 10, don't we? It says, welcome him. Welcome him. The Greek word is dekomahi, which means take him by the hand. Take hold of him. Don't refuse friendship. Don't refuse hospitality. Receive him into the family. It's not like just, oh, yes, welcome. Yes, welcome. It's, mate, come on in. Sit down, put your feet up. Get brought in here. Paul was encouraging the church to, to welcome him like that. Wrap around this guy. Reach out to him. Reach out to him. Paul had changed his opinion. He changed his views. He changed his mind about Mark. You're allowed to do that, you know. You're allowed to change your views. You're allowed to change your opinions about people. Someone who you may have disagreed with. Someone you've had an up and down with. You're allowed to change. You're allowed. And I think this example of Paul and Mark should tell us that it doesn't matter what can separate you in terms of your approach to how you think things should be done. Don't be divided by different ideas. Don't be divided by different approaches. Be united on the common ground on which you stand. 
Always, always, always look for areas of agreement. Always look to find, to stand on, and then build on common ground because ultimately that is what is going to serve you well. You've all been, over the years, I'm sure, been in churches where churches will split. What do they split on? Is there a rapture? Is there not a rapture? Are the spiritual gifts for today? Are they not for today? Do we baptise by three dunks with Holy Father, Holy Father, Holy Father? Or do we baptise by Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Or do we not baptise? Or do we sprinkle? Or do we... Uh, uh, Who cares? Seriously, who cares? You stand on Christ. In Christ and Christ alone, the rest can be worked out. Come together on common ground. Come together on common ground. It serves you really well. And this is the case with Mark. No one is ever finished off in the work of Jesus Christ. Even if you've fallen at the first hurdle, or even if you've fallen out with some of the main players. That doesn't write you off. Doesn't write you off. Warren Wearsby in his Bible commentary notes, John Mark is an encouragement to everyone who has failed in his first attempts to serve God. He did not sit around and sulk. He got back into the ministry and proved himself faithful to the Lord and to the Apostle Paul. Your run isn't over if you don't agree with someone. Don't buy into that. Just because you may not be currently connected or or currently have fallen out of favour with somebody who's the big cheese head honcho it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it doesn't that doesn't set you up and mean that that's your future far from it this young fellow got alongside peter later on didn't he and then he penned a gospel account that carries his name mark the gospel of mark mark should help us to keep our dreams alive our hopes alive even if others don't always see the same things in our lives and then we come on to this other guy don't we jesus Justice. This is going to be pretty quick. What do we know about him? Well, we know that the name of Jesus means uh, Eusus. Yahweh is salvation. Justice means just. And he's the last of the Jewish believers to be mentioned. There are a couple of other folk uh, in the book of Acts who have this Latin name, Justice. They're found in Acts one twenty three and Acts 18.7. But the consensus of um, scholarly thought around that is that It's not the same guy. So all we really know of him is that he was working with Paul for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And that he was a recipient of Paul's praise as to the comfort that he brought. Justice was a guy who brought relief, solace, consolation to those he was with. And he did so because he saw and he lived out the beautiful imagery of the kingdom of God by presenting the alternative social reality to those around him and by displaying the characteristics of Jesus to those in his sphere of influence. Jesus, the one they called Justice, I think was very worthy of his namesake. Very worthy. Which leads us now on to the three Gentiles. Kicking off with Epaphras. Epaphras, his name means lovely. My name means lovely. If you refresh your memory and go back to Colossians 1 verse 7, you will have learned the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant and he's helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. Epaphras was someone closely linked to the church in Colossae. And we know from this account that he was instrumental in actually establishing that church because it was Epaphras who actually took the gospel to them. Epaphras took the gospel to the church in Colossae. And we also know that he was sold out to the cause of Christ because it's noted here that he is a servant of Christ. A servant of Christ. And he was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer not only for the church in Colossae but he was also a man of prayer for the churches in Laodicea And also Hierapolis. A man who prays. And a man who prays for the churches in his area. I wonder how that sits in churches today in North Canterbury. I wonder how many churches within this area actually pray for one another. I wonder how many churches are praying for the other fellowships. How many times do we pray 
for the others who meet each week on a Sunday across this region. Not enough, I'd suspect. Not enough. So Epaphras can give us a good model for what we should be doing. We should be praying for the wider body. We should be praying for believers in Christ. We should be praying for unity across this universal entity which is called the church. And then you look at how he prayed in verses 12 to 13. His prayers, his prayers were mature. They were God-centred and God-focused. His concern was that the church should focus their attention on the will of God and that they would then walk in that will in order to accomplish all that needed to be done. And as folk followed God's will, he wanted them to grow in strength, understanding and an illumination of the way God works. He was a man of prayer who knew that prayer, for most ordinary people, is the secret weapon available to them. Prayer is is that secret weapon that can be let loose in any circumstance, in any place, at any time. So our prayers ought not to focus, um, ought to focus rather on God's will, not our wishes. Our prayers must focus on God's will, not our wishes. Our prayers need to be strategic, not just a response to some imminent incident. We need to develop a much, much bigger picture in our praying. One powered and fueled by the will of God. And we need to do it without excuses. W.H. Griffith Thomas notes, There are many things outside the power of ordinary Christian people and great position, wide influence, outstanding ability may be lacking to almost all of us. But the humblest and least significant Christian can pray. And as prayer moves the hand that moves the world, perhaps the greatest power we can exert is that which comes through prayer. Epaphras was a prayer, noted by Paul in Scripture and commended for his attitude and his approach to prayer. prayer. In fact, Edmund Hybert notes in his book on intercession, notes Epaphras holds the unique distinction among all the friends and co-workers of Paul, of being the only one whom Paul explicitly commended for his intensive prayer ministry. And the passage quoted above, which we just looked at, may well be called his diploma of success in this ministry. You see, with someone praying for them like that, the church were truly blessed. And we saw from history that the church growth then spread rapidly across the old Roman Empire and ultimately to the ends of the earth. Prayer fired up, fueled up and propelled by folk like Epaphras whose name we probably can't pronounce very well half the time let alone remember who he is he was part of that rocket fuel behind all of this stuff then we come to the last two players Luke and Demas Luke and Demas, the beloved doctor and then Demas, we'll start with Luke because he's up first Lucas mean light giving A Gentile physician who accompanied Paul, wrote the book of Acts, describing that incredible conversion of Paul from Saul to Paul, and the establishment of the early church. A few things to note about him. Not everyone agrees that he was a Gentile. Some think he may have been a Hellenistic Jew. I think he was a Gentile. Church tradition identifies Antioch of Syria as his hometown. Never been confirmed, but that's the church tradition. Again, according to a pretty fairly early and widespread tradition, suggests that Luke died at the age of 84 in Boeotia, in the region of central Greece. And of course, he's the one who wrote that very lovely gospel of Luke and the life of Christ, which is actually probably the gospel that I like the most, if I'm to be honest. Some scholars who hold a very different view here, but there are some very good credentials to support that this was written by Luke. Marcion, who was denounced as a heretic, Uh, is one of the ones who gives the earliest nods to Luke and the authorship. That's around 135 AD. The Muratorian Code, which is a copy of the oldest known list of books in the New Testament from around about 180 AD, which is pretty good, uh, also mentions Luke as the writer of the Gospel. And then Irenaeus, the early church father, AD 180-185, he noted that he believed that Luke wrote that Gospel. And he referred to him as the inseparable companion of Paul. The inseparable companion of Paul. And there are probably many reasons for that. Luke would have been physically capable. He would have been spiritually helpful to to, to Paul. He was a man of learning. 
great man of learning, that the, the writings in the Greek of Luke are such high quality. They're real high quality writings in the Greek. He was a man of learning, and this gave him a chance to pen all of those incredible accounts of, of probably one of two of the most incredible men that walked this earth. The first being Jesus. The next most incredible man to walk this earth, I believe, was Paul. Luke's Gospel, Book of Acts, makes up 27% of the Greek New Testament. 27% written by Luke. So his, his Gospel is the longest book in the New Testament. Followed up by Matthew, and then the Book of Acts is third. So in the top three, Luke carries two of them within the top three. Of all the books in the New Testament, Luke has both his works in the top three in terms of volume. He wrote more verses in the New Testament than anybody else. 2,157, actually. There you go. And for all you statisticians out there, next one will be Paul, 2,032, followed by John, 1,416, then Matthew, 1,071, and then Mark, 678, and the rest of the New Testament is made up by others, Jude, Peter, etc., Is it any wonder that Paul had him as an inseparable companion? This guy was going to be committed with a message and the recording of a message that was ultimately going to change the world. He was dedicated. He was steadfast in his support in the work of Paul. Uh, And and this whole work was about making known the God-man, Jesus, to Gentiles. And what he did was he used the skills he had and he wrote. He wrote to try and persuade people to believe in Jesus by presenting them with a very solid factual basis for their faith. Open up the gospel. Read it from the beginning. Dear Theophilus, see how he addresses it. Why am I writing these things? And then, of course, we come on to Demas. Demas, whose name means governor of the people. Probably the same guy that's mentioned in Philemon 24. Paphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. All that same sort of bundle of guys. He's also probably the fellow mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.10. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life. This is a real strong claim that's been levied against him by Paul. Encatalipo. Encatalipo. In Catalipo. He's abandoned me. He's left me up the creek without a paddle. He's deserted me. He's left me helpless. Totally abandoned. Utterly forsaken. This is the meaning around this word. There is some real depth of... Paul wasn't happy with Demas. He wasn't happy with him. He'd done a runner. Now, bearing in mind that Colossians was written around about AD 60, AD 62, 2 Timothy would have been written around about AD 67, within the space of five to seven years, five to seven years, something had changed in the relationship between Paul and Demas. Originally, he was a co-worker who started well, someone who presented and fronted up, wanting to be involved in this great move of God across the Roman Empire, but he didn't stay the course. And he went back to this place, Thessalonica. And it intrigues me that Thessalonica means victory of falsity. Victory of falsity. It had its victory over Demas, didn't it? Paul tells us that this governor of the people, or I would say man of the people, abandoned him because he loved the things of this life. And Paul uses that Greek word agape, agapeo, the love of choice. Demas chose to love other things. He chose a different way. He chose the things of this world and it ended up in a place where there was victory of falsity. Six men. Six men. All who can teach us something if we have ears to hear them. May just be me, but we appear to have a balance within both groups of both folk, Jew and Gentile. Aristarchus, Epaphras, Jew and Gentile. Faith forged, prayer fueled. Aristarchus had faith that had forged in fire and adversity, and what he did is he stuck with it. He didn't give up. He kept pressing on, not abandoning, n- not abandoning hope, not abandoning the people that he was with, not abandoning those he supported. Epaphras, God-centered, 
God-focused, targeting the will of God, bold in strategic prayer, always looking for the bigger picture. And like Aristarchus, pressing in to the hope found in Christ. And we have Mark and Demas, Jew and Gentile, a study in contrasts. Mark, who fell over in his early days, but he picked himself up to finish the course. And as a result of that, as a result of his perseverance, his name is enshrined and his words live on in a way that way beyond his natural life. And Demas, well, a lesson to us all in how you can start something. How you can start something. Don't go into stuff all guns blazing, all the bells and whistles sounding, only to find that you can't stay the course. Don't do that. He was strong in his early days. But he stumbled, he fell. And who knows? Did he ever return? Did he ever return? A study in contrasts. Justice and Luke... Jew and Gentile, neither spoken about much in this epistle, but Justus, who brought relief, solace and consolation to those he was with. And Luke, an inseparable companion, who as a physician brought healing, both of whom used their skills that they had in order to bring the kingdom of God to the attention of many, many others. Ordinary people. Ordinary people used by an extraordinary God. Because it's when you allow your life to flow into the purpose that God has stretched out before you that the full effect of your gifting, your talent and your ability will actually show up. Demas turned back through choice, perhaps never to regain his first love. But those other five men they demonstrated their faith. Faith forged in fire and adversity. Faith propelled by mature, targeted, strategic prayer. Faith that completes the course and goes the distance, even if along the way there are some stumbles. And faith that wraps around people, bringing light and life to the world. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we stand on the shoulders of giants. All of these ordinary people are giants. And we would do well to factor some of their way into the, our way in order to share our hope of the person of Jesus Christ. That's that. Bless you, church. Wear him well. Keep pressing on. Share him daily. And use words only when it's necessary. Let's just pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the incredible people that you have introduced and brought across our path um, in your book. Ordinary people whose names we can gloss over. But people who, who have stood the test and who have come out the other end. And Lord, I pray that for each one of us here, that whatever you place before us, we will stand and withstand the test and we will come out shining and shining you. So we just commit our time to you this week, Lord. I pray that you go before your people. I pray that you bless them. And I pray that they wear you well. In your name I ask. Amen.